Section six of the Sins of Hollywood by Ed Roberts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A battle royale that led to stardom. Love brings strange contrasts. It upsets traditions and turns precedent all topsy turvy. But what is love? Long years ago, when motion pictures were struggling along in baby clothes, there was a man whose total histrionic experience had been confined to carrying a spear on the speaking stage. He was a super. It was D. W. Griffith who gave him his first chance in the pictures, and he still carried the spear well. That, in fact, was about all he could ever do successfully. But it did not keep him from becoming a maker of pictures, of many popular pictures. But right at first it was a struggle. Somehow he managed to break away from a job, induced half a dozen others to put in their wages along with his, and take a chance on making a comedy. Finally, they sold their finished production and realized a profit. With this money, they made another picture, and by degrees, the spear carrier became the sole owner of the company. The others worked for him. Such is the law of humans. The man with the executive ability wins always in business. This man was an executive. To make it easier to comprehend his title, we shall call him Jack, which is not his name. Now there was a girl, a comedian, who started out with Jack. She was his leading woman through all the vicissitudes which accompanied the first experiments in pictures. It was Molly who cheered Jack up when things went wrong who kept all the players in good spirits. And so it came about that Jack learned in his crude way to care for her. So did many another. But from the beginning, it seemed that Molly's affection leaned more toward Jack than any other of her pals in the good old days when custard pies and stuffed bricks were coined into golden ducats. Time went on, and gradually the other suitors pulled away. Jack was winning out. True, now he had more money, and fame was beginning to look in on him when he was at home. The world looked particularly good to Jack. With some of his now easily earned money, he fitted up a handsome apartment. To this love nest, Molly came often. No, they were not married. It seemed fair enough to Molly, she who had been reared to look lightly upon moral conditions. She could see the point. As a married woman, she would not be so popular in pictures. And so they drifted along for a year, two years, and then... One day there came on the lot an attractive brunette. Straight away the girl, shall we call her May, and Molly became friends, then pals. It was May who proposed that they be good friends. At first Molly demurred, then she agreed. It was a diplomatic move. There was a good deal of talk going on around the lot. She wanted to stop that talk. So she frolicked with May. Jack was true to her. This the girl knew. Of course, there were a large number of new faces around the studios these days. They were necessary in the sort of pictures Jack was making. But Molly worried none about them. Her Jack was hers, always. 
and so blissfully working her way along towards stardom molly drove on the lot with a song in her heart each morning and with a happy smile on her face in the evening wasn't she kept by the great maker of pictures himself was not she soon to become a star was she not earning a wonderfully big salary but jack began to get young ideas true in his way he loved molly he does yet but temptation tossed her curls and beckoned him to come and play along the highways of immorality temptation guised as a shapely maid with alluring lips and firm rounded bosom called to him and he began to take heed temptation's other name was may there were little parties arranged quiet parties in secluded places molly all blissfully ignorant of these meeting places still went about her work with a song in her heart once she was called out of town for a couple of days she returned one day ahead of her planned schedule a friend whispered a word to her she was dumbfounded certainly it could not be true her jack would not do such a thing the friend offered proof all she needed to do she was told was to quietly go to a certain apartment that evening late and she would learn something molly dashed to the apartment the friend following they took may by storm she opened the door may was naked to her skin molly's worst fears were confirmed for there occupying the bed was jack like a tigress molly tore at the head of the sleeping may but she reckoned without her adversary may was the stronger the more cat-like of the two with a bound she was up and fighting her former chum grasping her head may thrust molly's head against the wall time and again she battered it against the wooden casing of the window lacerating the scalp tearing long gashes in her cheek jack hurriedly dressed and like a slinking coward sneaked out and down the elevator and fled molly fell unconscious her head bleeding her breath coming in gasps may waiting only to see the havoc she had wrought too hurriedly dressed and went to a hotel for the night molly with beating head and too weak from loss of blood to go downstairs called in her physician the next morning jack quaking with fear called up the apartment she was deathly ill he was told no he could not see her the doctor said she was too ill well then was there anything he could do he was told to go to hell that scared him all the more just as molly and her friend expected it would so he called up the doctor yes molly was in bad shape the end in grave doubt only hope for the best jack started sending flowers and gifts of every description and wanted to hire all the nurses and doctors in town but it was no use they would not let him see her every day he was told she was getting worse then about a week after the eventful night one of the los angeles papers came out with a seven column screen headline molly dying 
Jack was petrified with fear. He called in his man Friday. At that time, a cadaverous young man with a reputation as a clever fixer. Friday got busy. The first thing to do was quiet the papers. By the pulling of a few advertising strings, the newspaper stuff began to abate. The journal that ran the seven-column head in its first edition on the first page buried the story in the center of the second edition, under the smallest head it could find type for. Of course, the editor had to be convinced that he was in error, that the lady was really getting better already, was mending rapidly. Jack had a very busy fortnight following the battle. Between keeping the papers under control and trying to find out just how ill Molly was, he didn't have much time to make comedies. Every request that he see Molly was denied. She was too ill, far too ill to see him or anyone else. Yet somehow or other, the papers had allowed the story to drop. It was two weeks later that Jack received a curt summons to call at the apartments of Molly. Her head was still swathed in bandages. She was pale and thin. The doctor said she might not get well. Jack was offered an ultimatum. The ultimatum was this. He must immediately build a new studio away from his lot. He must employ one of the finest directors obtainable. He must buy a first-class story, a comedy drama, something to which Molly aspired. Then he must star her, advertise her, spend money in making her name known offer her hundreds of luxuries to which she had never before been accustomed, and he must pay her an enormous salary, away into the hundreds of dollars per week. There was another alternative. The doctor said she might die. May would be held for murder. Jack would be an accessory. The whole sordid affair would be aired. Jack would be ruined. The producer faced either ruin or the necessity of spending a fortune upon the woman he said he loved, if she lived. Now, as a matter of cold, sordid fact, Molly was not ill. She was not suffering from her injuries. She had been cured. But doctors are odd persons. And this one was her friend. Nearly two years were spent on the production in which Molly was starred. Of course, the new studio was built. Many a first-class director went down to defeat before the picture was completed but she received everything she demanded. And what she demanded was plenty. The picture was not released for still another year, but it was a good one. It made the star famous and rich. Jack made a lot of money in the meantime, and he needed it. Molly took heavy toll. Finally, when her big picture was cut, titled, and released, she found that she must go to New York. There she remained until her name was spread about the land as a great star. Daily there came to her frantic telegrams, begging, pleading with her to come back to her Jack. He needed her now more than ever, he said, and he wanted so to be forgiven, and they would start all over again. 
There was a long silence. Finally, Jack received a telegram. It said, Just signed a long contract with Undisclosed. I am to be starred in comedy dramas at a salary, the basis of which you started. You and I are all through. Goodbye. P.S. You made me what I am today. I hope you're satisfied. Molly. End of section six.